Um, in February of 2010, there was a raid in um, Gardez in Afghanistan in Paktia province, and uh, a U.S. special operations team had intelligence that there was a Taliban compound and that people living in a particular compound in this area were members of the Taliban and were plotting attacks against American forces. And they raid this compound in the middle of the night, and they end up killing uh, a number of men and two pregnant women. Um, and it turned out that this was not a Taliban family. In fact, they weren't even ethnic Pashtun. They were, they were uh, uh, from a minority ethnic group in the province. And they, the man of the house was a senior Afghan police commander who had been trained by the U.S. forces. And, and his family showed me his documents. He had actually been trained by a private security company called MPRI. Uh, which is made up of very uh, of high-ranking former military officials, intelligence officials, and others. And so these women were killed. This Afghan police commander who had fought with U.S. soldiers against the Taliban and against the Haqqani network in his province, and, and whose house was filled with pictures of him and U.S. soldiers uh, smiling in these pictures, had, had just been killed. And when the, when the commandos that ra the U.S. commandos had, that raided the house realized that they had killed these women and that the men that they had killed were not, in fact, Taliban, and that what they were doing that night was the most anti-Taliban of things they could have been doing, which was to be having a party with live music, celebrating the naming of a child, and men were dancing and playing instruments, and it was this loud, boisterous party, and we have their cell phone video from that night. So they, they, they raid this house. These people are killed. Instead of saying, wow, we, we really messed up, and owning it, and that stuff happens every day in Afghanistan. People are getting killed all the time that have no attachment whatsoever to the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or the Haqqani network, and the U.S. will often just pay them a little bit of money and, and move on, and it never makes it into the papers. Th that wouldn't have been out of place, but instead of doing that, they dug the bullets out of the women's bodies, and then they told their commanders that what had happened in the compound that night uh, was, a, was a Taliban ambush uh, of this family, and that they had come upon these women who had been killed by the Taliban. And then they, they were leaks saying that, well, no, this was actually an honor killing, and the women were killed by their own family members. And, 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 and they put out a press release, and, and spokespeople made these statements saying that, this, that the U.S. soldiers were essentially heroes that had gone in there and saved everyone else. But then the, the, the family members, because they were a prominent family, one of the, the fathers of the women was the uh, vice dean at Gardez University who spoke fluent English, started calling reporters and telling people, you know, this is not what, what, the, what NATO is saying. Then a very great reporter named Jerome Starkey actually went down there. He writes for the Times of London and interviewed the family members and did a story saying that this was a NATO raid. He didn't know it was JSOC at the time, that, the, that this was a botched NATO raid and that NATO had tried to cover it up. And he told the story of these families. And when Jerome Starkey did this, NATO did something extraordinary. They named him in a press release and said Jerome Starkey of the Times of London is lying. They actually accused him of lying. And I mean, that, that could have ended Starkey's career. And Starkey, to his credit, kept pushing and pushing and ended up doing a number of stories and got close to that family. And Rick and I also went to this family and filmed with them. Um, and you'll, you see this in our video and tell this story and tell the story of what happened to Jerome Starkey as well. So, so media attention is, is, is focused in now on this village and this one family's compound. And eventually, uh, NATO calls up Starkey and they said, we're about to put out a press release. We're going to change our version of events. And they admit that their forces had killed, that NATO forces had killed these pregnant women and that the men were not Taliban commanders. Um, so the family told me and told Jerome Starkey the same thing, which is that they got a call and, and, and a person they believed was General Stanley McChrystal was going to be coming to visit them. And at the time, McChrystal was the commander of all U.S. and NATO forces in Afghanistan. And they actually were plotting, they wanted to kill General McChrystal. They wanted to stab him to death when he came into their home. And one, and one of, the, one of the, uh, the, the, the men told me that when, when they did this uh, to my family, I wanted to put on a suicide vest and blow myself up among the Americans. Remember, these were U.S. allies. And now they're saying, I want a suicide vest and I want to kill General McChrystal, who was the leader of the war. And, a, and an imam at their local mosque said, no, you're not to do that. You're to give him hospitality like our people do, and you're welcome him into your home and hear what he has to say. So they thought that General McChrystal was coming to see them. They called Jerome Starkey. Starkey goes down there with his photographer, Jeremy Kelly, 
and they're waiting with the family, thinking that McChrystal's going to show up. And up pull, pulls this convoy of vehicles with countless uh, Afghan uh, military officials and some Americans interspersed with them. And they, in the center of this crowd is a guy with uh, a name tag that says McRaven on it and, and has three stars um, on the lapel. And, um, and they've brought with them two sheep. And, and, and they approached the compound in the very place where the women had been killed and, and this command, police commander had been killed. And they offload these sheep and they put a knife up to the sheep, sheep's neck and they're going to sacrifice the sheep. And that what they were doing was a, was a ritual from these people's culture, the people who, who were the victims of this. And they were, it was like a forgiveness ritual. So they're coming. Admiral McRaven shows up with some sheep after this family had been gunned down. And, then they, and they had blamed it on the family and then said it was Taliban. And that, so that, this scene is unfolding. This photographer, Jeremy Kelly, starts taking pictures of, he didn't know who he was at the time, of Admiral McRaven. And at the time, Admiral McRaven was the commander of the most elite, secretive U US military force. And, and he shows up with a sheep in Gard Gardez, Afghanistan, and they're offering to sacrifice it. And the American and Afghan forces try to stop the photographer. They try to hit the camera away. They say that Starkey and, 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 and Jeremy Kelly are not allowed in. But the family, and it was so smart of them, the family said, no, we, we want him here as a witness so that someone independent is here to know what, you, what goes on today. And so they have photos, and Starkey took in shorthand all the notes of what McRaven said in the room that day. And McRaven admitted to the, the head of this household that it was his forces that had killed these pregnant women and, it, and, and, and the Afghan police commander, and he apologized. And then there were all these stories that went out on ABC News and others that the head of the household had, had accepted the apology. When I spoke to him, he said, I don't expe expect, accept their apology at all. He said, the special forces did cruel things to us. They beat us. They ruined our life. They wiped out our economy in our, in our compound by taking away all of these people. And they killed our pregnant women. I wouldn't trade my two sons for the entire kingdom of the United uh, States. The first drone strike, actually, that, uh, that was conducted outside of Afghanistan. Um, was in Yemen in 2002, and it killed a number of people, including a, a U.S. citizen named Kamal Darwish. Um, and, uh, and he actually was not, um, uh, was not supposedly the target of that strike, but they claimed that he had ties to a, um, a, a terror cell called the Lackawanna Six, which, like many of the plots we've seen lately, seemed to have been, the, in large part, the FBI breaking up its own plot. Um, and which is really scandalous if you look at how many times this has happened in, in all these cases of entrapment. Um, but so President Obama starts, decides to start bombing Yemen in December of 2009. They do this strike on what they are told by the Yemeni government and by U.S. intelligence is an al-Qaeda training camp and that there is this notorious al-Qaeda figure who's known to be in the camp. Well, it turned out that this guy, when, when we investigated it and went to Yemen and spoke to people that knew him and knew the infrastructure of AQAP, that he was an old jihadist who had fought in the Mujahideen War in Afghanistan and, and, and had a very peripheral connection to al Qaeda. So it seems like what happened is that the, you know, the U.S. outsources a lot of its intelligence gathering in Yemen to um, notoriously corrupt uh, Yemeni officials and agencies and, uh, and to the Saudis. And the Saudis have their own war that they're waging inside of Yemen. The U.S.-backed dictatorship of Ali Abdullah Saleh was playing multiple sides, playing the Saudis, playing the U.S., playing various tribes inside the country. There were several occasions when Saleh fed the U.S. intelligence, saying someone was al-Qaeda, and it turned out to be a political opponent of the regime that was being killed or assassinated um, by, by the U.S. on behalf and the service of the dictator of Yemen. And so in this case, in December 17, 2009, they, they bombed this village supposedly to kill this one guy who does not seem to have been anything even vaguely resembling a senior al-Qaeda figure in the country. And, and, uh, and after the, the missile strike happens, um, the Yemeni government puts out a press release taking credit for the strike, saying it had conducted these airstrikes. And the Obama administration congratulated the Yemeni government on taking the fight to the terrorists in Yemen. Uh, a number of tribal leaders in Yemen got phone calls from this small, poor Bedouin village called Al Majula uh, that this missiles had slammed into the area and had shredded people into meat. And these tribal leaders went there, and also a young, this young journalist, Abdullah Haider Shaya, who had done reporting and work for the Washington Post, for ABC News, for Al Jazeera. He was a very, very well-known journalist in Yemen. 
And, and he was known because he was a brave guy who would go and actually interview Al Qaeda figures. Much of what the United States knows about uh, certain leaders in Al Qaeda come from the, comes from the reporting of Abdullah Haider Shia. He, if you, you could look at it one way and say it was, he was a very valuable guy to have out talking to these people because it helped the U.S. intelligence officials understand or operatives understand who it was they were supposedly trying to kill. Um, and that, but that's, that's for a different story. So this guy goes there, these tribal leaders go there, and they, they take photographs of the missile parts. And they then share, show them, broadcast them on Al Jazeera and other outlets, and share them with Amnesty International. And Amnesty International has a, uh, a weapons expert come in and analyze them, and they determined that they were, uh, that there, it was a cruise missile attack. And, and, uh, and when, when Rick and I were in Abiyan province, we had the parts filmed. They're still there in the desert, by the way. You can go, if you want to try to go to El Majil, you can go there, and they're still in the middle of the desert. Uh, with general dynamics and made in the USA right there, visible, and we show this in our film. We show the, the aftermath of this bombing and, uh, and the missile parts that were still there, you know, at well after the bombs had dropped. But the U.S. also, but the, the, the other wep, uh, bombs that they found there were cluster bombs, which of course are banned under, under international conventions. And, uh, the cluster bombs are basically, I, I saw the effect of them when the U.S. was using them in the Kosovo War in 1999. I, I went to the niche marketplace after it was bombed um, in Serbia and saw the aftermath of it. They're like flying landmines, and they shred everything in its path into, into meat and limbs, and it is horrifying to see the aftermath of any bombing, but cluster bombs are a particularly brutal weapon. And there were unexploded cluster bombs that were left there. And after the bombing had taken place, some children were playing near a cluster bomb and picked one of them up and it blew them to pieces uh, two days after the bomb, bombing had happened. So they take these pictures, they send them to Amnesty International, and these sheikhs, tribal sheikhs, organized a gathering to say that this is not the Yemeni government that did this because Yemen doesn't have these missiles. Amnesty does an analysis of them and determines that they were, in fact, U.S. weapons and that only the United States could have been responsible for that bombing. And so this sort of scandal was brewing inside of Yemen because the people who were killed there, there were at least 46 people killed. Um, 14 of the people killed were women and 21 were children. Uh, when the Yemeni parliament, which is, is a, which is supported by the United States, went to investigate it, they listed all of the dead, their ages, their names, their genders, and I got a, a, a copy of that report and, and have the list of every single person that we know of that was killed in that strike. And we added it up and it was... 14 women and 21 children among the 46 dead. And uh, in the pursuit of trying to kill this one person who the President of the United States had been told was this high-value target who everyone in Yemen says was a, an older Mujahideen who had primarily done his jihad in Afghanistan and not inside of Yemen. When this started to become public, this Yemeni journalist was going on Al Jazeera and was helping other U.S. media outlets report that story, that it was in fact a U.S. strike. U.S. officials were denying it and eventually then anonymously said, yes, we were behind the strike, but General David Petraeus said that uh, no civilians were actually killed in the strike and that it's all a big exaggeration, which was very offensive to Yemenis of all political stripes, and so it was an enduring scandal. And this one journalist was really pushing this story. And he continued to report on other, on the expanding U.S. air war in Yemen. And one night, in the middle of the night, he was, uh, he, in the middle of the day, he was out with a friend of his who was a political cartoonist, and they were shopping, and he was snatched by U.S.-backed, uh, U.S.-trained counterterrorism forces in Sana'a, the capital of Yemen, and was taken to the political security prison and was beaten uh, bloody by the security services and told that he was to stop talking about the missile strikes. And then they released him onto the streets. And what this journalist did was to go straight to Al Jazeera and say, I was just beaten by the political security officers, and, and they're trying to stop me from talking about the U.S. missile strikes that are happening um, in the country. And, and soon after he did that, his house was raided by the, the CTU, the counterterrorism unit, which is a JSOC and CIA-trained entity. And they snatched him out of his home and disappeared him for 30 days. And no one knew where he was. And then they hauled him into a court that had been specifically set up by the dictatorship to prosecute journalists for crimes against the state. And, and was ultimately convicted of being uh, a, an al-Qaeda facilitator because he facilitated al-Qaeda members being able to speak to the media. 
and, uh, and which I've talked to people in U.S. intelligence who, who, who actually also believe that this case is outrageous because they said you took off the streets one of the best reporters that we would read who, so we could actually understand what was going on in Yemen because of the notorious corruption of all of the informants. So he is put into this prison. He's put on trial, total sham trial. His lawyers refused to present a defense. No lawyer would represent him at his own request because he said, I don't want to recognize a shred of legitimacy of this process. And we have video of him when he is in prison. They bring him in front of the, in, into the courtroom in a, in a cell. They have him in a cage in the cell. And as they're pulling him away, he said, my crime is exposing the American missile attack on the tiny Bedouin village of Al-Majla in Abiyan province. They're putting me in jail because I exposed their cruise missile attack. And, the, and he said, this is what happens when, when, when Yemeni journalists are real journalists and they pull him away and they, and they, they, they disappear him into this prison.